Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final point. Tonight we're going to continue our discussion with Daniel Duvall. We didn't get to discuss everything last time. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Hi, can you hear me, and uh, how is my volume? Uh, I'm hearing you okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much for having me back. It's a real pleasure. Well, we want to get into some pretty heavy stuff tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off by explaining how we participate or walk in the kingdom. How does that work? Wow. Well, that's a loaded question. Uh, let's just get started. I guess the thing is, Christians, in my opinion, really have historically lacked a good foundational understanding of what the kingdom of God is, what it details, and and what it means. And in our last program, and for those of you that may be listening to this program and did not hear the last one... Uh, we 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 really kind of got into the kingdom and and some of its implications but going a little bit deeper just what does it mean the kingdom as i have begun to understand it as a disciple of jesus and one who has been pursuing deeper understandings of these things for for years now and spent countless hours in prayer and the word, just studying and seeking the Holy Spirit and God on you know, on these things. I I've come to understand that the kingdom, God's kingdom, is really best understood as the realm in which he's king. And when I say realm, I say that because it tangibly exists. There really is a very real kingdom. It's it's a very real place a cluster of places with a very real king, God, who is there and ruling over the whole thing. And this realm, which is separate from our realm, is designed to invade, infiltrate, and overtake our realm through the heart and actions and lives of God's people. This is really the central understanding for what it means to be a participant in God's kingdom, that we are here as ambassadors. What what does that mean? Okay, when the United States sends an ambassador, say, to Africa, an African nation, or Europe, or whatever, uh, they, they remain a citizen of the United States, but they go there for uh, political purposes, economic purposes, um, <laughs> uh, even even things dealing with business and trade internationally sometimes but you you send an ambassador who represents the kingdom from which they are being sent so so, so the idea of a christian being an ambassador is the same idea we are members of a very real place a realm where where god is king and god has a law god has a a system a structure a way of doing things and resources unimaginable and he now places us in this world as ambassadors to execute i mean what you could even call it just um political services on behalf of the kingdom which we are representing right so we want to introduce people to our god we want to introduce people to his resources and blessings we want to tell the world about uh, what we belong to, where we hold our, our we hold a, a heavenly citizenship. So we're here as ambassadors. What does that mean? That means there's a very real place that we are representing. Okay, and and that God says in His Word, the kingdom is within you. And in the Amplified Bible, it says, "For the kingdom of God is within your hearts and surrounding you." It really gives us the idea that God has taken His kingdom overlapped it upon the hearts of believers for what purpose? So that it could actually, its its resources, its power, its 
and, 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 and it's love because everything in God's kingdom is upheld by the law of love. Every so so God is love according to the book of first John. Therefore everything in God's kingdom is after his nature and likeness. This uh, atmosphere is literally intended to envelop the life of a believer, and it can transform everything that comes in contact with them as this thing gets played out. So I, I think the question then becomes, okay, well, if this is true, let's say we are kingdom citizens, and God has put his kingdom on the inside of our hearts, and he wants us to walk in this world and reveal his kingdom to people, uh, the deeper question is, okay, what is the mechanism? In other words, how does this actually manifest? And, and this question is great, and, and I love to answer this question because the answer to this question builds faith. It's hard to accept something we don't understand. Uh, for instance, let's say someone comes running and says, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I saw this gigantic cone. It was a traffic cone. And it flew into the sky and in an out of order space. And, and I saw it with this big ball of gas underneath. Now, if they came and we said, well, hey, you know, I know that a traffic cone doesn't launch into outer space with a big ball of fire and gas on it. But when someone brings me a book with the mechanism, it says, oh, no, uh, really what happened is NASA scientists they built a space shuttle, which has a triangular shape. They have all of these different, uh, you know, <laughs> rockets on it that launch and have the amount of thrust required scientifically, here's the equation, to put that shuttle into outer space. Now I can say, oh, no, that is true what you're saying, but you, it wasn't a traffic cone. It was a space shuttle. And and the thing is, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are like this. We can begin to see something uh, or see a concept, but when we don't understand the mechanism, we don't understand what's behind it, sometimes it's difficult to accept it at face value at all. We we, 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 we might, you know, be pointed out to us like, oh, look at this. Well, you know, oh, I see what you're saying, but I don't accept what you're telling me about that. I, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. Here's one of the key verses that this happens with all the time, uh, really uh, it's so central to the kingdom issue. It's in, amazing. But the scripture we find in Ephesians 2, 6, for he has raised us up and seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And uh, for some reason, you know, Christians just they, they have a really hard time understanding that God didn't save us to take us to heaven when we die. He saved us to manifest us in heaven right now. That that's why we're all that's why it's a past tense verb even in the original Greek. It says he has raised. That's past tense. Why? Because we're already there. How does that make sense though? It's the same question. How does God work this thing out so that the kingdom is overlapped upon our house? Well, what is the mechanism for for these questions? How do we make sense out of this? And uh, I, I see that you and you know you had, we had titled the show uh, "Heavenly Operatives Transcending the Physical Plane as the Children of God" and and and, and you know I, I threw that out there to you because I, I realized that when we talk about these things, this is what actually happens. People begin to understand these answers. Now they have the faith to transcend the physical plane, which they're already doing. They just don't know that they're doing it. And I'll repeat myself again. How do you know you're already transcending the physical plane? Ephesians 2 6. <laughs> alone. That verse alone. Um, Colossians 1 13. For he has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his dear son. When we understand the kingdom is a realm, it's outside of our realm, that means it's not on the physical plane like Russia and uh, China and the U.S. and Mexico. Now we understand, well, if we're already placed there, we have already transcended the physical plane. So it's not about actively like learning how to, say, do some occult science and project our spirits out of our body to do astral projection and, and things like um, remote viewing and so forth. Well, no, that's, that's not, I would never teach anyone to do those things. That's not of God. But that Christians 
are inherently, due to their <laughs> identity, uh, transcending the physical plane. And there are benefits and blessings and power that we begin to access, influence that we begin to access against the devices of wickedness in this world that only become acted on when we know what God is having us to do, what we can do, and what we can have faith for. That's why God says, you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. When you don't know what you can do and what God can do, you don't know to believe for it. And if you don't know to believe for it, well, that, that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence. You know, it, well, it's not going to be there. You don't have faith, you're not going to have the, the manifestation. It, it, you just will coast through life living, and I say it, far below privilege. And that's what I tell Christians. Christians are oftentimes living far beneath privilege. Who they are, what God has given them, what God has called them to do, they're not touching any of it. So, I, my goal is to help people. Back to the question. How does the mechanism work? Um, and, and did you want to interject anything before I move forward on this, Dorothy, or am I okay? Um, I think you're doing just fine. I'm hearing breaking up. I'm trying to get back from the chat room of it. They're having good sound. Do you know if on Blog Talk if the host is allowed to hang up and call back, or does that end the show? It won't. It won't end the show? No. It, it, this has happened to me before. I actually got kicked out, and I had a guest on, Rick Wiles, <laughs> and he stayed on the line, okay. and when um, I came back, yes, it was you would just... go on about the mechanism, and you stay on and talk about that, and I will hang up and try calling back in, because I'm breaking up, and I think it's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the mechanism. In order to understand the mechanism, how... Christians can exist simultaneously in heaven and on earth, how the kingdom can overlap upon the heart of a believer. What we need to do is understand uh, two basic concepts. One is how God created man, and two is how God ordered the heavens. We'll start with with the latter and then work our way to the former. How did God order the heavens? In the book of Second Corinthians, chapter um, 12, verses 2 through 4, it says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I can't tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I know a man, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body uh, I cannot tell, God knows, how he was caught into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And... In that passage, what we find is a reference to something known as the third heaven. This is the only place in the whole Bible where there is a reference to the third heaven. But we also find that it is where paradise is located. In other words, the location of departed saints. So, as we look at that and we say, well, if the third heaven is the location of the departed saints and where Paul heard all these wonderful things, then... then This is also going to be the location where God is existing and manifesting his throne, dominion, and rulership, and so forth. This is really the realm of the third heaven. And when we look at other passages in the Bible, like where did John go in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 5, where he sees the Lamb of God proceeding forth from the throne from the Father to take the scroll, and uh, there's all these, you know, the, the the living creatures around, and w- all this worship going on. Where does that happen? Same place, the third heaven, okay? Um, in in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah is called and God asks him, who will go for us? The seraphim takes the coal from the altar and touches the lips of Isaiah. You know, well, where is this scene happening? Again, it, it's third heaven. It doesn't call it the third heaven, but we can understand that this is the realm where these activities take place. Okay, so when we understand that this is a realm and this is really the heaven of heavens, uh, then we have to properly ask our question, well, what is the second heaven? And if we look at passages like Daniel chapter 10 where we find the heavenly messenger coming to Daniel and saying, I was held up for 21 days by the prince of Persia. We can begin to understand what kind of activity takes place 
outside of our realm, but beneath the realm. Of, because in the realm of God, really, you find perfection. You, you don't find uh, demons making war in in the third heaven. And never once is there a picture of war going on in that place in the Bible. But the war, war does happen. So where does it happen? And the Bible says in Ephesians six twelve four, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness and against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And that's the New King James translation. But uh, that heavenly places are places, literally spiritual locations, above the earth realm, the three-dimensional plane on which we live, where spirits exist and inhabit, and also where spiritual conflict will occur. There's other references to the second heaven. Um, For instance, Ephesians chapter 3, it says in verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, that God wants to reveal his wisdom to these spirits in the heavenly places of the second heaven through what he does in the church, which is a powerful thought, and I'm not going to go any further on that note, but then when we get down beneath the second heaven, we enter the realm of the first heaven, and that's really defined, I think, best in in, in Genesis 1. God uh, creates a firmament and divides the waters from the waters during the creation week. And when we talk about firmament, what you're really talking about is a space or gap. So when God creates a space or gap by separating the waters from the waters, what we're saying is, well, he took of the waters that were present and put some in the atmosphere, the others became the rivers and the oceans and so forth on the earth. And there was a space or gap in between which became the atmosphere or the air we breathe, the space inhabiting immediately above the the ground that we stand on and so forth. It's our world. It's the three-dimensional plane that we are living in. This this is really where we find the definition of the first heaven because God, he makes his firmament and guess what he calls the firmament? He calls the firmament, that space or gap, he calls it heaven. So we have uh, different references to heaven and they're not all the same place. It's not always talking about the sky. It's not always talking about outer space. It's talking about different realms entirely. There's the earth realm, there's the realm of spirits that occupy dimensional space immediately above earth and then there's the God realm, or the God dimension, as some would call it, even myself, uh, the third heaven, the place where God's kingdom is located. And these, the second heaven and third heaven places are separated from earth primarily by a dimensional separation as opposed to uh, so much a distance as in space. Spatial separation. In other words, Russia is separated from the United States by a certain number of miles, but the kingdom of God is not separated from a believer by any space at all because it is abiding in their hearts. So how does that work? The separation is dimensional, and it can be bridged through dimensional transactions. And with that said, now we have to understand, to to, to then uh, discern... The next, like, uh, you know, how God created man to be a uh, <laughs> a heavenly operative. Uh, what, what is the design of man? And, and the answer is, well, man is designed a three-part being. And in First Thessalonians chapter 5, we find it pl- clearly. Uh, in the very God of peace, sanctify you holy. I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved brilliantless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's clear that there's three main parts. There's a spirit, there's a soul, there's a body. And in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, we read, for the, for the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we have, well, soul, spirit, bone and marrow, that's the body, and then also this realm known as the, the heart. So we have these different areas of our existence. And when we properly understand these, it helps us to understand how God created a mechanism for heaven to literally overlap upon the believer. Okay? Starting from the outside working in. Our body is our flesh. The Bible says that which is born of flesh is flesh. And the flesh is really what ties us to this dimension. We we need our flesh to operate in this world. Can't do it without it. 
we don't have it, we're dead, we're somewhere else. Uh, moving beyond that, there is the soul. Now, the soul is best understood as the mind, will, emotions, intellect, and so forth. It can be understood as who the believer is, okay? Um, in the Greek, the word suki is translated for soul. And uh, it's also translated for mind. And uh, that that helps us to understand that the soul really, <laughs> it is both the soul and the mind. It, it, it includes the mind. It includes the will as well. Uh, and we can discern that from different passages in the Bible. Like um, in Acts 4.32, you find a passage saying, well, they were of one heart and one soul. The people, they were of one heart and one soul. If you come to a place where you are one soul with other people, really you're using your will act of your will, to come into one accord with people. So so this act of the soul, this operation of the soul, includes will. It includes the mind. It includes emotions. Okay, Your soul can be troubled. How do you get your soul troubled? What is that? That's an emotional response. It's, you you have emotions in this realm. So this, this is the soul. And the soul is designed to be renewed according to the Word of God, right? Um and we renew our soul by renewing our mind. Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Uh, working our way one step deeper, we get into a realm, I call it the subconscious. It's the, the the heart realm, really. Why do you call it that, Daniel? Well, the Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Uh, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 23. What does this mean? This means that a person's heart literally has the ability to generate everything that they will experience in this life, okay? Um, what is the realm responsible for that that has been defined by psychologists and so forth? Well, that would really be the subconscious realm. And it's beneath the conscious. Some people would try to call this maybe the, the lower soul. This is another term I've heard used for the heart realm. We're talking about the same thing here. We're talking about a realm that can be programmed, and this programming means what are your internal belief systems and structures. When you understand that the heart is the location of these things, then we understand that when God wants to put his kingdom on the inside of our hearts, what he really wants, us, wants to do is put his kingdom, his framework, his way of thinking, his way of getting resources around, his way of doing things, appointments, giving mantles, giving anointings, and so forth, his ability... All of these things becoming our operational paradigms as opposed to the average Christian's operational paradigms. I don't have enough money to pay the rent next month, therefore God isn't able to provide for me. I got rejected last year at school, therefore I'm going to get rejected this year at school as well because, well, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, you know, we Christians get a lot of twisted thinking. Where is that manifesting? Well, it comes in your mind, sure, but really that internal belief system is in your heart. That That is where it abides. What God wants to do is put his kingdom thinking on the inside of a believer's subconscious so that all of a sudden now you don't think in light of, well, I was rejected last year, so I'll be rejected this year, and every ministry I go to will also reject me because I'm designed to be rejected. No, well, now I'm accepted in the beloved, and everywhere I go the anointing of God precedes me, and I'm going to be a blessing everywhere I go. And... uh it, it just it changes the way you operate. It actually will change the very, you know, uh, there is a bioelectrical current that runs through the human body. Every human has one. It, it, it there is, uh, it, it, it's not just biochemical reactions. Now people are getting, beginning to understand that there is a very real electrical uh, field around every person. And I believe that this electrical field is very much manipulated and changed and uh, <laughs> defined by the activities of the subconscious. So when you hear people in the New Age talking about, man, I don't like that guy's vibrations, well, really what they're talking about is that bioelectrical field around the person that they're uh, being able to sense in a, in, in, to a degree. And it's a reflection of what the belief systems are in that person's subconscious. So it, it really, it, the, the whole thing ties together. God knew what he was doing when he designed us, and everything validates itself. Um, the Bible says in Jeremiah 7:19, the heart is deceitful above all things. It, you know, you can think that you believe something one way, but really if you get into your heart, 
you're deceived. Your heart is actually deceiving you, and uh, you're totally, totally off base, you know. You, 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 a person may think that they know the things of God and they are intimate with God, but when you really get down to it, they see God as a judge only and their worst nightmare. And they are so scared to sin and they think they're, they're being holy um, because they are so afraid of God and penalty and they're living in total bondage. But, well, the heart has deceived them because really God is a God of love. And while he wants to redeem us from sin, really that's a response. Response <laughs> to the holiness and righteousness of God pervading our being. It, it's a, a response to relationship. It doesn't have to be a bondage of fear. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's so many ways that Christians get deceived on the road to true intimacy with God and truly coming to a mature understanding of these things. But, you know, we have to understand that our subconscious, well, it can deceive us, okay? Now, in order to allow the power of God, the resources of God, and the kingdom of God to be sourced into our lives, our heart is not the final destination, but we have behind that, which, which is really the heart is kind of a component that exists between spirit and soul. And it mediates between the two in a sense. It's where all the programming is stored, where the subconscious the, 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 or the lower soul, as some have called it, is, is found. And when you get to the spirit, well, now you're at the point where the Bible says, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now we understand that, okay, well, the spirit of the Christian is inhabited by the spirit of God. Now, this operation makes us a new creation. We no longer exist the way we used to. How, how do we know that's true? Well, the Bible says, <laughs> and uh Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are coming. Where, where does that happen? Well, that happens in the spirit man. That old spirit man was dead. Now it's alive in Christ. That spirit man was broken in sin. Now it's born into the kingdom of God. So when when the Bible says things like we have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and and into the kingdom of His dear Son, what literally happens is a spiritual transaction where the Holy Spirit enters the spirit man of a believer. And that spirit is taken out of the realms of darkness and captivity due to original sin, where it's been, and is extended into the dimension of God at that moment to, from that point forward, exist in heavenly places and realms as a citizen of that environment. Why does Colossians 1.13 say, into the kingdom of his, translated into the kingdom of his dear son? Well, that's what happened. So now when we understand, okay, so now we understand what salvation actually does. It extends my spirit into the dimension of God because the Holy Spirit inhabits me. Now I, 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 I can stand in the realm of God because Christ, Jesus, has become my righteousness. So not out of my own righteousness, but in his righteousness. I can be in this place and in this realm. When we understand that, well, it becomes really easy to understand, okay, no, if I'm there, what does that mean? And then this is the next question. Well, what does it mean? It means that there is a way, literally a pipeline, your spirit, to bring in the resources of that place where we are currently existing and into our subconscious. And when it, when it overtakes our subconscious, well, now it can overtake the very bioelectrical atmosphere around our life. It can change the way people perceive us, we perceive ourselves, the way our very environment responds to our presence, our faith builds, we mature and grow. I, I'm telling you, the kingdom message must begin with an understanding that we are presently inhabiting God. Because if we don't understand that we have access to this place, we're going to live like we don't. We're going to live like God's up there, we're down here, and we're doing our best to survive and struggle and deal with impossible situations and hope that our, par our prayers are good enough for God to come in and, and throw us a bone. When really God says, come boldly before my throne of grace to find mercy and grace, help and time and you, well, what does that mean? When you understand that you are presently existing in heaven, then you just have to say, wait, okay, let me get a revelation. My spirit will now literally walk in heavenly places to the throne room of God where I have been given access up to God's throne literally now that I'm in prayer. Kneel before that throne, boldly requesting of God right there in that place, I need grace and mercy. 
<laughs> and he's going to say, yeah, here it is. See, this is a transformation of paradigm. When we begin to think like this, now everything about Christianity changes drastically. Let me, let me stop there, and, and I'm going to let you kind of redirect me or ask me any other specific questions, Dorothy. Okay. I'm still breaking up, so I'm hoping I'm coming through. Um, that's an awesome description of the kingdom of God. We are actually there once we become saved and take on the righteousness of Christ. And if you really try to absorb that and what that actually means, all the ramifications of that, that's pretty cool stuff, you know? Yes. Um, now, we have we have jobs to do while we're here, do we not? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> or work, yes. you can call it work, but Father, I think Father expects us to expand knowledge of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He expects us to fight the enemy through spiritual warfare and to bring in the manifestations that he has given us, like the manifestations of healing. And all those gifts of the Spirit are actually things we're supposed to participate in bringing to the unsaved and to the world to show people who he is. Yes. Is that actually a statement? Yes. Well, and uh, Okay, I'm just going to keep going forward on this thought and kind of continue to break it down a little bit more because this is where uh, you really get into some exciting things, okay? This is really where you get into some exciting things. This is the problem... With Christianity oftentimes The problem with Christianity oftentimes Is that it is lived And experienced Outside of alignment With heaven What does that mean? Okay Assignment In heaven God speaks to your spirit You are To be a businessman Because your anointing Is for business And you will bring in resources And treasures to finance other people, which I have called to do other things. <laughs> and that businessman anointing gets taken into a traditional church. And they tell him, Sir, God wants you to be a deacon. And you're not supposed to make money or a lot of it because that will ruin your life. Money is the root of all evil. Therefore, we are going to make you live beneath what you were living in before because we want you to be more holy. And Okay, now what that false understanding, which is grossly exaggerated, I think, uh, has done, is it has taken that person who has been given assignment in heaven. And because on this side of reality... They have convinced that poor soul that he is not supposed to do those things which place him in alignment with heaven. Now, everything he does is out of alignment with heaven's resources. Because guess what? God will give the resources of heaven to the people that are positioned in alignment with with heaven. <laughs> but for those believers that are living out of alignment, guess what? It's not going to be there at all. It, it, or if it is, it's going to be severely limited. This is why Christians need to stop thinking the wrong way. When we understand that there is a very present reality occurring between our spirit and God and between our spirit and God's kingdom, and that to access the true resources that we should have for this world, we need to be in alignment with those things on this side of reality. 
We'll do all kinds of craziness. And that's what Christians do. All kinds of craziness. People are doing crazy things. They are living in ways that are so backwards and contrary to the nature that God has given them, to the callings and giftings that God has given them, just because they understand things the wrong way. And and, and so what I'm trying to communicate here is, when you understand that the kingdom means a very real presence in the realm of God, and a very real access to the things of God in God's realm, then we understand, whoa, oh, okay, we need to make it a priority to put our lives in alignment with what heaven says. Let me, here's another example. Let's say a person's been pastoring a church for 12 years, right? Because in their Bible school, they were told, well, you know, uh, there's nothing but pastor. You want to serve God, be a pastor. That's it. You can be a pastor. Uh, if you graduate from pastor, you can teach at a seminary and be a pastor, you know. Okay, well, hold on. The Bible says, for God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the... <laughs> All right, Ephesians 4.11. So we understand that pastor isn't the only office appointed in the body of Christ. So let's say that person is being a pastor for 12 years, and they are totally stuck. And they are totally discouraged, and they are totally not fulfilled. But they're serving God. They don't know why. They're guilt. They're in guilt and condemnation because they believe, I thought I was serving God. I I gave my life over to him. I, I'm serving God the best way I know how, exactly the way they told me in Bible school. And and I, why isn't my life blessed? Why am I not fulfilled? Why am I not satisfied? Well, maybe God didn't call that person to be a, a, a pastor. Maybe he called him to be a prophet. Maybe the prophetic anointing has been sitting dormant, literally stuck because they won't receive it. They don't know what that office means or how to walk into it. Maybe God called them to be an evangelist. Maybe in a single church, just pastoring, they feel like a caged animal. Why? Because they need to be out there preaching the gospel. That's where their resources from heaven are going to manifest. Not in that pulpit where they're falsely presuming <laughs> their resources are going to manifest. So the Bible says in Ephesians 1-3, it says, We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And in our last interview, I expressed to you how God has shown me, well, what these spiritual resources mean is that we have limitless resources financially and uh, for, for the healing of nations and people and, uh, you know, resources of warfare uh, in the heavenlies, God's armies and so forth, all these things, but those are for use and application <laughs> according to those that are in alignment. God, doesn't, God, God is not in the business of wasting resources, folks. And I've learned this. God is not in the business of wasting resources. And God is the steward of stewards. So he's not going to give a person all of their resources, right, uh, for an assignment when really they're, they're doing something totally different. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Let's say you're a policeman, right? And uh, uh, you go to stop a burglary, and I give you a big fire hose. No, what you need is a gun and handcuffs for that job, not a fire hose. Now, if God called you to be a fireman, but you're trying to be a policeman, why is God going to give you a fire hose when you go out to stop a burglary all by yourself? Now, see, in the, in the natural, this makes sense. But for some reason, Christians don't get that. It's really, the kingdom is the same thing. It's the same thing. So when God calls us to do something, all right, appoints us, because that's what God does. He appoints. See, in a kingdom, it's not a democracy. We don't say, hey, who wants this job? You know, everybody raise your hand and say, who, who thinks this job is an acceptable job to have? Oh, I don't, you know. Like, no, that's not how it works. God, God is a king. A king is a governor of his whole kingdom. And guess what? He makes all the rules, and the people in the kingdom get to follow the rules. And, and when he wants someone to do something, he tells them to do it. That, that's, that's how it is. So God is sitting in his in his throne, he says, I need you to do this. You say, okay, I will do this. And he says, okay, now you have access to all my resources to do that job. Done. Okay, if Christians all across the world could get this concept, just imagine what kind of transformation would happen in this world. What kind of harvest 
would begin to take place. I, I, I'm saying I believe that there, there there are entire economic systems that could be liberated from institutions like the World Bank with the wisdom and resources of heaven if Christians just applied themselves to their callings and access the resources from heaven. Because uh, guess what? The resources of heaven uh, supersede the laws of the earth realm. Let's say that again. The resources of heaven supersede the laws of the earth realm. In other words, what is impossible with man is possible with God. One application of understanding the kingdom. One application of becoming a heavenly operative. What does it mean to be a heavenly operative? It means to be fully aware that your operations are based in heaven and must be reflected in this earth, it, 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 this opens so many doors, Dorothy. I'm telling you, it opens doors like you can't imagine. And there's so much breakthrough in this thing. Here's here, here's something else uh, the believers don't understand, and uh, I'm, I'm going to get to this. Okay, uh, becoming a heavenly operative. What does it mean? To operate in the heavens, right? So we understand the Holy Spirit has inhabited our spirit, brought us up uh, to the kingdom of God, and now we are there and we are active. Okay, what does that mean? Did you know that your spirit has the same sensory capacities as your physical body? Listener, follow me on some of these scriptures, and I'll prove to you that your spirit, man, is just as aware of spiritual environments as your physical body is aware of physical environments. In the same way you can walk up past a donut shop and smell those donuts and fall in love, well, you know what? Your senses on your spirit can pick up on spiritual aromas. <laughs> this is really cool stuff. You, you, I, I, believers need to understand that they are not bodies waiting for a, a, a magical essence of them to land in heaven when they die. Because that's been the prevailing, I think, uh, block, the, the, just box of thought that, that has really kept us bound up. We think too small of ourselves. We have no concept of identity. All, really, the message of identity isn't fully understood until we understand that we exist as heavenly citizens in a heavenly kingdom presently right now. How else can you say, I am a king and a priest? Where are you a king and a priest? Because sitting in your living room, right, arguing with your kids over who's going to take out the trash, is not. you don't feel like a king or a priest. But <laughs> why is that true? Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's, let's be real about this thing, you know, when you're standing in line to decide, well, am I going to get pepperoni or sausage on my pizza that I'm going to pay full price for? I mean, where where is that king and priest identity, you know, and then you can, you know, find those people that, you know, they're super spiritual Christians, and they just, oh, yes, I'm a king and a priest, oh, yes, I mean, you know, and they walk around and shout off these platitudes. But you watch their lives, and you say, well, there's no fruit, brother. Where, where's the fruit? What, you, you say these things because you heard a preacher, and it got you excited. But there's no manifestation following your life. Why not? Well, it's because they haven't had a revelation. See, this whole concept has been missed. The whole kingdom message has been totally missed. And, and, and so you just have people either they don't understand it, they're shouting off platitudes, they're not accessing it, okay? It, it, it's just a mess. So now, understanding that our spirit man has senses helps our mind to begin to make the transition consciously to say, wow, now I can begin to understand that while I have physical experiences on earth, I am presently, actively, continually having spiritual experiences in the spirit realm and my spirit is engaged in those things. See, and and to help people before I go into this, I, I use the term unconscious mind. I use three minds when I when I explain this. I, I say there's a conscious mind, there's a subconscious mind, and uh, there is an unconscious mind. Why is there an unconscious mind, Daniel? Well, because your spirit man has a mind. Your spirit has a mind. He does. Your spirit has a sensory capacity and ability to process events 
that are happening in the heavenlies, and your conscious mind will not be aware of those things. I tell people, tell me, what was it like for your spirit to be translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your dear son? What, what happened? Tell me how it looked in the spirit realm, everything that you saw as you were being flushed up into that new realm. Oh, no one knows what that was like. Why? Because their spirit man underwent that experience. And it is housed in, really, a mind that we are not conscious of normally. If we are conscious of it at all, for most people, the only time will be under certain circumstances in their dreams. So, but the, but the spirit, it has senses, okay? What, oh, how about touch? Okay, angels. God makes his angel spirits and his ministers flames of fire. Angels, they carry trumpets. In, in Daniel 9.21, they touch people. They, they hold objects. Swords, Numbers twenty two, twenty three. Angels, they have swords. They can write in books. How, what does all of these activities require? They, they requires touch. That we wear spiritual garments, put on a garment of praise. And that garment, once it's on that spiritual body, it is touching that spiritual body. The body, Bible rec, re, recognizes that we have wedding garments. This is touch. The spirit man has touch. Matthew thirteen, uh, fifteen. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Everybody that Jesus was talking about there heard him talk. He was speaking in parables. Everybody heard him talk. There's no one that missed what he said. So why did he say that? Well, it's because he was referencing the ears and the eyes of their spirits, which are what will perceive the things of the spirit and of the things of God. So, the spirit man really has a sense of touch, a sense of hearing, a sense of sight. How about this one? Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste? Why does it say that? How about this? Uh, Hebrews 6, 5. And have tasted of the good word of the Lord. Tasted of the good word of the Lord. And see, your spirit man can actually taste. <laughs> it might be slightly different than, uh, you know, physical taste and stuffing food in your mouth, but... It, well, how about this? The Bible says that we are going to participate in something called the wedding supper of the Lamb, or the wedding feast of the Lamb. The wedding feast. Why would he give a bunch of glorified, uh, fully manifested sons of God at that time after his coming? A wedding feast. Well, there's a spiritual element to this thing. Um, even the Word of God is described as strong meat and also milk, depending on how it's presented. Uh, smell. But I have all and abound, I am full. I have received of Aphrodite the things which were sent to you. An odor of a sweet smell, sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Philippians 4. They, you see, these people, they sent a financial gift to Paul's ministry. And Paul said that financial gift was a sweet-smelling aroma. Okay, Wait, did they spray those coins with perfume? Well, no. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that this gift in the spirit created an incense which was pleasing to God. So there is such a thing as an aroma in the spirit, a smell. One of those things that will cause an aroma is a sweet-smelling sacrifice, okay? So the, the five senses, touch, hearing, see, sight, taste, and smell. Our spirit man will experience all five. Why? Because it's necessary to experience and perceive those things for what our spirit man is involved in in the heavenly places. <laughs> it's amazing. So, let me stop there and, and I'll uh, I'll let you redirect me slightly if you want to or just respond before I continue. Okay. Um... I'm still having hearing difficulties with my phone for some reason. Um, hmm. You're hearing me all right, though. I I hear you perfect. Okay. Um. So, as heavenly operatives, so we weren't saved just to go sit on a pew and listen to a preacher give good sermons <laughs> and make us feel good. <laughs> oh my goodness! 
No, of course we weren't. <laughs> I'm just saying, of you know. Course. Yeah, I, I, and I understand because here's the thing: a, a lot of Christians are there. That's what they, even if it hasn't been directly said or stated in that way. Uh, a lot of Christian activity in certain t- churches and traditions basically boils down to this. You go to church. Um, if, you know, you don't sin much. And uh, although many of these churches will propagate the identity, the, the, the sin-centered identity, saying, you know, you're just a lowly sinner. That's all you are. And you are perpetually in need of the grace of God. Well, you know, the Bible is clear that we were once sinners, but once God removes that nature, we begin to access these things. Well, now we engage the world as, as children of God. Um, we have to physically and actually take the time to stop sinning and repent. There's no question about it. But we we have to move beyond this 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 false identity. But, you know, they, they, these people, they, they trap them in this system and they say, well, yeah, if you're just coming to church, you know, on a regular basis, an extra credit, you know, pay some tithes and give some extra. I mean, that that really is what you're supposed to do because unless God calls you to be a pastor, what else is there? You know, lead a Bible study, maybe. Uh, for, for, for women, you can, you know, serve the homeless a meal. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just so... Uh, sad. I mean, it's sad. It's so sad. Oh my gosh, it's it's heartbreaking. And and here's the thing, okay? People on the outside, I I don't know how many people I, I I've talked to. They come to me. They say, Daniel, I've been to church. I've seen Christians, and I see what you guys have. Why would I want that? <laughs> Who have you been watching? You know, it's like, well, I've actually been to like three or four churches. Like, oh, okay. You know, th- so this is a real problem because the testimony to the outside world is not a demonstration of God's kingdom at all. What is it? What is it? It's a demonstration of how to be miserable by living outside of alignment <laughs> with heaven. That's what it's an idea. It is a demonstration how to be miserable by living outside of the parameters and the unctions of God's commands being issued forth as edicts from heaven, but ignored on this side of reality by the men who are supposed to be the shepherds and leaders of the entire body. I'm telling you, man, this is why, and I'm sorry, uh, Dorothy, I, I said man, but I'm not calling, calling you a man. I, <laughs> this is like when I it just comes out. Uh, no, but I, I mean, it's like, come on. What God is preparing for his bride now, I believe, is a huge transition away from these things. God doesn't want pew warmers. God wants heavenly operatives. Because this is where things get exciting. Okay, Once you understand that you are presently in heaven, that you have access to heaven's resources, that you can put yourself in alignment with heaven's edicts and assignments, then you enter a true supernatural life because the realities of the kingdom of heaven begin to overtake circumstances because that's how God does things that is how God does you want to see a ministry like what Paul had what Peter had look at putting yourself in alignment with God's kingdom now I'm I'm skipping over some things here because um, frankly the, the, the worst part of this message for most people is okay Let's let, 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 let let's do some straight talk here. Stop watching that pornography, bro. Woman, stop fantasizing about all those men that you see on a daily basis at your job. Okay, stop putting yourself in those situations where you're doing nothing but getting in arguments with people all the time and having to go back and gossip about them later. All right, how about we stop lying? All right, they, see, there is a problem with combining a sinful lifestyle and a heavenly lifestyle. See, they, don't, they do not go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, it says adulteries, fornications, uh, murders, sorceries, etc., etc. These things do not inherit the kingdom. Folks, I want to tell you some things that are going to blow your mind. There's no question about it. But Frankly, you're not just going to get access to it because you heard me talk about it. The moment you set yourself to say, God, I'm ready, guess what God's going to do? 
He's going to break you, and he's going to break you hard. And you're going to crumble into a million little tiny pieces until you're clay. And then he's going to put some water on you, the water of his word, and he's going to take his big mighty hands, right? And he's going to remold your whole stuff because the way the life of most Christians is lived today cannot be brought into alignment with the kingdom. So God has to reshape, remold, and reconfigure <laughs> before Christians are going to access some of the things I'm talking about. So don't get me wrong, folks. I like to talk about the exciting things, but I am not one of those guys that's going to baby us up and is going to lie to you and say, oh, no, you don't have to worry about the basics. <laughs> because the basics never change. You need the basics. You need a prayer life. You need time in God's Word. Period. And you need to forgive all those people you've been holding on to all that bitterness about. Just, you, I'm telling you, you got all this bitterness and, and, and all this unforgiveness and all this hate and so forth. I'm telling you, this kingdom thing is going to evade you forever. Because you will literally build a spiritual wall between you and the things of God. As a Christian. And Christians do this all the time. I, I, and, and, and so don't think that the things I say are just easy because I say them. No, I'm talking about a life that is fully sold out to Jesus Christ. I, I, how, how can I tell you anything different? If I did, I would be lying to you. God requires submission. You have to place yourself under his mission. Um, and <laughs> there's no easy way out. And God, hey, here's another one. I know you're going to love this one, Dorothy. God doesn't skip steps. God doesn't skip steps. In other words, okay, I was in five minutes of prayer a day for the last three years of my life. I went to church every other Sunday. I gave 1% of my income to Jesus. And, and um, you know, I, I, I just did my own thing as often as possible. But I heard this guy talking about how I'm attached to the heavenly dimension. So now I'm going to believe God for a million dollars to build a giant facility to create media and distribute it over all the world for God's glory. Yeah, right. God is not going to give that to you. I don't care how much you think you have faith. You have not put yourself in alignment with God's kingdom yet. First things first. Let's improve that prayer life. Let's repent of all those things. Let's break every generational curse in your life, which could take years. How about let's grow and mature through great acts of obedience to God's word and commands to you personally in your life in situations and circumstances that seem impossible to obey in. I'm saying, you know, uh, here's one. When I moved to Illinois, okay, I moved to Illinois, I was working. My wife was working. We had jobs. I had uh, contacts where I was living in Tulsa and so forth. It was the word of the Lord came, said, move to Illinois. What was in Illinois for me? I had a house waiting for me and nothing else. I had nothing, nothing. My wife's family was here. But as far as opportunity goes, there was nothing here. When I moved, we had to move by faith. There was no guarantee from Earth's perspective that we would find jobs and that we would be able to cover our expenses and that we wouldn't just go bankrupt, right? So this is an opportunity for fear. This is an opportunity to say, no, God, I'm going to do things my way. I'm not just going to go and leave the way you told me to and believe you for the provision when I get there. Now I'm going to stand back and I'm going to say, well, I'm not leaving until I get a job. And, and that's not what we did. But let's say we had done that. Well, the devil could have come in because we're out of alignment and literally stuffed up every job opportunity until we went years without responding to that word. And guess what? Years wasted. Because we're not moving forward. We're not actively progressing in the plan of God for our lives. We're in suspended state of animation. We are totally uh, just, you know, <laughs> stuck. So what we have to do is go back and respond to the last thing God told us. So when we left, I, I just did. I said, you know what, God, I believe you. You're going to provide for me when I get there. And I moved. And he did. We moved. And we got here, we went two months without a paycheck, and one month later, I signed a $10,000 contract to publish my first book, which I had to pay in full by August. 
I'm telling you, the testimony is that I paid all my bills. I never had to skip a meal unless God told me to fast. I still got to eat out. I got to do fun things. I paid the entire $10,000. I never missed ties at church. And I didn't pay a dime of interest on any loan or credit card at all. Now, how did that happen? The provision of heaven overtook my circumstance. I'm just saying, this is how it works, folks. We have to respond to God. We have to be willing to take these steps of obedience. Because when we're not willing to do that, guess what? We're not positioning ourselves on this side of reality to uh, partake of the things of heaven. You see, so when I say things like, Yes, we have to put ourselves in alignment with heaven. What does that mean? Well, that means walking out in acts of obedience and faith, plain and simple. And when we get beyond the tests, then we get to the glory things, right? So then we get, I mean, this thing could progress to the point where it says, okay, Daniel, I want you to walk down the street. I walk down the street. People just start getting healed in the houses I walk by. Why? Because the Bible says, Peter walked down the street, and they put out the sick and the demon possessed, and as his shadow passed over them, the sick were healed and the demons were driven out. Okay? Talk about alignment with heaven and heaven's resources. Angels were literally going to battle everywhere he set his foot on behalf of God's kingdom because he was in alignment with heaven and doing those things which God called him to do. See, this is what God has waiting for his people that will be responsible to do the easy stuff. You see? And, and 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 this is what I try to communicate. You know, I, I'm, I'm saying everything begins to make sense when we put it in context with being a heavenly operative. It puts the whole message of the gospel together. <laughs> yes, Father is very big on obedience. I found that out. Hmm. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, if you want him to be real with you, you got to be real with him. You know, you just got to put it out there. Yes. Yes. So 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 really and and, and here, here's how this this thing um can go a little deeper and I there are a lot of passages I have found in scripture that really you, you can't understand until you begin to understand heavenly things. Um, and I want to tell you an experience I had, which was absolutely shocking, because it changed the way I thought about how God could work. Okay, I was praying for an individual one time who was really in, in, in having some problems. And this individual, <laughs> you know... I, I, I really wanted the work of God to manifest in their lives. And I wanted the lies that they were buying into to be broken off of them. So what I did was I prayed, <laughs> like any good Christian brother would do. And as I'm praying, and I'm deep in prayer for this person, I begin to hear a voice speaking. I actually begin to hear the voice speaking. And what I hear is a communication of all of the lies that the person is believing. And I hear from God regularly in prayer. I hear from God regularly in prayer. I mean, I do. I, I, I pray. I hear from God all the time. God will actually, in my prayer life at this time, do this thing where I'll be praying and I'll start to pray. I'll even be quoting scripture. That's how I usually pray. I, 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 much of my prayer is quoted scripture. Because I know that there's power in praying the word of God. Well, he'll interrupt me. I just feel it in my spirit. It's stop. Just stop. And I stop. And I'm quiet. And I listen. And God begins to tell me what he wants to say. What he wants me to know. This happens all the time. It's just the natural progression that my prayer life is taking me to. And it's wonderful. Because what I have with God, what I have with Jesus, is true relationship, communication in two directions. And this is what all Christians, you want to put yourself in alignment with heaven, you're not going to do it without a two-way communication going between you and the man upstairs. You need it. That's why you need a prayer life. And you need to know the Word of God so your prayer life doesn't get sabotaged and take you outside of the parameters of God's Word into some craziness. 
<laughs> which I've seen uh, people enter into. So, uh, but, I, you know, on this occasion, I'm praying, and I hear all these lies. And I say, whoa, that's not God. God would never say those things. And I operate in the gift of discerning of spirits often, and for me, the, the way the gift works is that I begin to, within myself, see impressions of what is occurring in the spirit realm. I'll see places, I'll see things in operation, angels in operation. Um, I'll, I'll, I recognize when certain demonic forces are in operation, the operations of human spirits and so forth. And, and, you know, I begin to perceive these things not as like an open vision with my eyes open, but I discern them in, you know, kind of like my solar plexus area. It's just like I, I have like a movie playing down there. Sometimes it doesn't come through as like a vivid movie. Sometimes it's just a knowing or a perceiving, an understanding, a, 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 a piece that I know that I know. And, well, but but this was kind of like a movie internally. And, and what I perceive is this person, this person that I'm praying for, and they're talking to me. And telling me all of these things, and I see on them the the actual chains and bondage, like literally, uh, hand like 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 chains <laughs> on on the spirit body of this person that's talking to me, and immediately I understood what had had just happened. What I was hearing was the communications of the person's spirit the person that I was praying for because that spirit was convinced of these lies and was necessarily in bondage where? in heavenly places it, and, and, and so God wanted to show me that so I could pray more effectively targeting what I was able to perceive there's it, when we get into deep prayer and, and we begin to understand how, how we can be operatives in the heavens, we understand that God can give us revelation through his... Why are the gifts of the Spirit weapons? Well, if you're no longer throwing darts... Like, this, this is how some Christians pray. Let's say there's a dartboard on one end of the room. And I give a person a thousand darts and a dart gun. I say, there's a dartboard somewhere in the back of this dark room. But I'm going to turn out the lights. Just throw all the darts you got, and hopefully one or two will hit that dartboard. And it is, you know, they just spray all the darts everywhere. And then we turn on the lights, and we find that maybe one or two got close to hitting the mark. If we got lucky, one really did hit the mark. You know, maybe we got a bullseye one out of ten times. Um, but th- this, see, this is the real, like, this is the concept of prayer for most people. They, they, they're doing this thing where they're just throwing it, just throwing it out there. They, they don't know what they're praying for. They're like, uh, problem, uh. Uh, okay, God help them. You know, like, well, what does that mean? But when we get like something in operation like the discerning of spirits, what that does is that say, okay, no, don't don't fire your gun yet. Let me turn on the lights. Now you can see exactly where that dartboard is. Now aim and shoot everything you got in that one direction. Guess how many are going to hit that bullseye? See, so so there's a whole new level of accuracy in prayer, which really. That's what the devil is scared to death of, right? So, so um, now this person of these bondages was free not too long after this experience had happened. I prayed for them, and then I was able to minister to them afterwards, and boom. I mean, we just, there, there was breakthrough and freedom. It came. And what I'm saying is, uh, in order for this to happen, uh, what, 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 what really was at work here? Well, we are in operation on the spirit realm at all times. And our, our spirit, man, can be experiencing all kinds of things, not only in the realms of the third heaven, but this is the kicker, also in the realms of the second heaven simultaneously. This is, this is why I say that the human spirit has a trans-dimensional nature. And this is really deep stuff for a lot of people, which is why I'm talking slow and I'm... Um, doing my best to kind of explain this in as logical a way as possible. Because these are, these are deep things. These are spiritual things. Um, hard to discern, but if I explain it well enough, you know, I can trust that the Holy Spirit will do the rest. But, okay, in the same way that our spirit is extended to the third heaven, and some people are going to have, you know, major problems with this, yeah. It's extended to the third heaven, but it's also in operation in the second heaven. It also is. Why? Ephesians 3, 
3. Ephesians 3. That, that's my evidence. Ephesians 3.10 says, To in the, the intent that now the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. What does that mean? They are presently located in the realms of the second heaven. So in order for God to show them his wisdom through the church, the church has to be present in the second heaven as well. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. So the, the church... Wait, what, how about Ephesians 6.12? Same thing. For we... We, the body of Christ, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So, so we're there. We have to be there for these things to make sense. We have to be there. So we are not only on the first heaven plane, earth, not only in heaven's plane where God is in third heaven, but also in the realm of the second heaven. And this is the problem for a lot of believers, is that with sin and generational curses, etc., in their lives, they can actually be put in degrees of bondage on the second heaven plane spiritually that need to be broken by the power and, and uh, uh, provisions of Jesus, which are true and waiting for manifestation in the third heaven. You see, so while, while we do presently partake of total freedom and liberation, all these things in, this, in the third heaven, when you get down to the second heaven, now, now see, you, you, you've changed your level of operation, what you're looking at entirely. And people are in bondage. Now, I, I want to share a passage here. This is what I use. Because, I, you know, I cast more demons out of Christians than non-Christians. That's just the way it is. Why would I cast demons out of a non-believer? It's just going to come back. How, but... But people say, well, a demon can't inhabit a believer, Daniel. That doesn't make any sense. Like, well, are, are you alive? Ha, have you seen ministry today? Do you know what people are going through out there? Do you know what Christians are going Have you ever prayed for somebody? I, I, and I, I just don't understand these things. But, um, you know, I, I just I, I take people to Acts, the book of Acts, and I tell them, listen, um, there was this story, okay? There's this guy, and his name is... Simon. All right, and what happened? And uh, I'm, I'm going to turn to the story because I'm going to read a part of it. But <clears throat> what happens is that this Simon guy, this sorcerer, he uh, he gets saved and baptized by Philip's ministry. See, Philip was. One of the uh, original deacons that were appointed by the apostles, and then the, this uh, huge persecution hits Jerusalem. So now everybody gets scattered, and Philip goes down and and um, he visits this place uh, where Simon, this uh, this sorcerer, is really like doing great things, and he has all the people convinced that that he is the very power of God. I mean. He really has pulled one over on these people, right? But what happens is <clears throat> Philip, he goes forward, and he begins to minister in the power of the kingdom. Now, Simon doesn't really have anything to, to uh, uh, say at this point. He, he's amazed as well. And he's, uh, the only thing he can do is say, wow, I, I think I want what you have. So he gets saved and baptized. So what happens? Um, Philip leaves, and uh, Peter and John, they go up to the, the same place, and they say, uh, okay, we're going to get everyone baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, here's a problem. This guy, he, uh, he tries to buy the gift of the Spirit from Peter. He tries to buy it. Because he thinks that, well, that's how it works. If I give them enough money, they'll give me this new anointing, you know. Um, man, I don't know, maybe he has some gifts passed to him by his uh, former witchcraft days. But, but now Peter has to rebuke him. So this whole thing is happening in Acts chapter 8. And as uh, in verse 18 you see that Simon sees the apostles, they're laying on, on a hand, he offers them money, saying, give me this power, so that whoever I lay my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. So Peter turns to him and rebukes him. He says, Thy money perish with you because thou hast 
thought the gift of mon- God may be purchased with money, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the heart of God. Verse 22, Repent therefore of this, thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond, and in the bond of iniquity. Now, most people look at this passage and they say, oh, well, yeah, see, money's evil. And when you try to buy the gifts of the Spirit, or if you're a minister of God and you try to sell a product, you're evil as well. They say, okay, well, hold on. Is that really what's going on here? Uh, first of all, let's look at the uh, – see, I'm gonna, I, I, I want people to understand this. Most people do not perceive what Peter just revealed about Simon. All right? Now, when we go back in this story – and we uh, we read verse 13 in Acts chapter 8. It says, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. Okay, Acts 8, 13. He sa- it says he believed and was baptized. Now, what does Mark chapter 16 say? It says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That, that, that's pretty clear. If Simon was saved and baptized, was he saved? Yes, he was a Christian, yet he was not fully mature. He had to be refined, rebuked. He had to be built up. He had to grow, and he had to receive deliverance post-salvation from bondages to iniquity. Why? Because in verse 23, Peter says, through the revelation of the Spirit of God, I perceive. Now he's looking at his spiritual nature. That thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That's after he's saved. Now see, this is the thing. Christians will get saved and still be in bondage in the second heaven. And they need to apply the liberation and resources that have been purchased by Jesus, presently active in the third heaven, to those things so that they can fully embrace the inheritance that they have in Christ. When I saw this person's spirit, what I was seeing was their bonds on a second heaven plane. I was looking, I actually saw, and I heard the communications of this person's spirit, which led to excessive accuracy in what was going to be ministered, and even that prayer time itself, which led to that person's uh, complete deliverance shortly thereafter. Now you tell me, is that of God or is that not of God? Of course, God is trying to liberate his people, and, and that's why we talk about these things. I want everybody that hears this to say, wow, you know, maybe it's time for me to, to, to see where I'm, I, I'm still in bondage, you know. Um, I, it, people have so much bondage. The enemy has bound up the body of Christ beyond belief. And, and we, I'm not even getting into now, because this is a whole other level, the kind of bondages that occur when people are subjected to trauma-based mind control. Because when people are subjected to this, and through excessive trauma at early ages, personalities are split, and some personalities are Christianized and called to believe in Jesus. Others are uh, put in bondage to service to the devil himself. I mean, well, yeah, that person might be showing up in church. But, but, and and for those of you that have never heard about this before, you know, just start looking up trauma-based mind control. Do, look up some YouTube videos. Dissociative identity disorder. I, I don't have the time to um, really break this down in this show, nor is this, uh, you know, something that I, I planned on getting into tonight. But what I'm saying is, well, these people... They want Jesus. They're following Jesus and to the best they know how, but they need serious help, and they need people that understand how to resolve, well, uh, cast out demons, <laughs> resolve issues with personality integration, um, and break up bondages in the heavens. I mean, it, this this all is necessary, and more. And so... Um, this this is not something that really I, I think needs to be understood by the body of Christ. You know, people they think they get saved and now demons can't touch them. But if you look at their lives, well, man, they have so many problems you don't even know where the demons begin and end. And uh, and I'm just saying, like, well, if you really want, if a person really wants, if, God, if the body of Christ is really going to rise to the level where we are on this earth, walking out the power 
of God's kingdom and truly experiencing what it is like to be a heavenly operative, we're going to have to claim and lay hold of the deliverance that we need. Otherwise, we're going to be blocked. We're literally going to be stopped by our, 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 uh, these issues until we choose to resolve them head on with the resources we presently have. See, God gave it to us. And so we need to put our faith on it. And, and, and we can't do that until we understand it, which is why I'm saying it. You know, um, no, I think a lot of, so many Christians don't understand where the bondage comes from and how they, in their own lives, open doors and in relationships open doors. You know, it, it's a subject that, that the body really needs to get a better handle on. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's there, there's so many ways to open doors. And and, and really, this, this, this is what I would say. I mean, there are some key passages in the New Testament that give us an idea of what's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, In Galatians 5, we find one such passage. I'll just read it. Um, Galatians 5. It says, the works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. This is King James, folks, so get another Bible if you don't understand what some of these words mean in Old English. I encourage that. Uh, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before and I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If people are engaged in these kinds of activities, those are open doors. That is your open door right there, okay? A willful sin in these areas. That's why Christians, they, they need to live lives of repentance because that, even if you open the door, guess what? It's getting closed right away. Um, generational curses are also a big one. Generational curses are big. The Bible says that God will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. That that means that there are generational curses. And, you know, there are things that your father or grandfather may have done. Maybe they entered into a covenant with the devil that said, you know, um, I, I, I not only put myself on this altar for, for these gifts you want to give me, but my next three generations, I'm selling them to you too for your purposes. Like, okay, well, if that agreement was made, there are certain rights that exist in the spirit realm until those things are renounced by the believer. So, you know, there are iniquities. I, you know, people need to understand that generational curses need to be broken. And there's a bunch of good books about this anymore. I mean, this is not so new. At one, one point in time, no one knew what this meant. Now, there's been a lot of revelation on this. A lot of people have come out and written books on it, done teaching. Um, if you don't know and you're listening to this about generational curses... Just type in generational curses in a search box. You will find a ton of information on this issue. But this is another big area. Uh, some people don't understand that uh, you know they're in bondage because of witchcraft that is actively being performed against them. Now, you may not be actively willfully sinning in horrible things, but if you have no prayer life and you're not in the Word and you're just coasting through life, uh, these believers tend to not be armored and defended the same way as Christians that are in prayer, in the word, in repentance, and in relationship. And I've read enough books by witch doctors and uh, other people that came out of the deep occult to know that they make a distinction between real Christians, that they call them real Christians, and lukewarm believers, which are nominal which, you know, they, they think they got their free ticket to heaven, but really, it, and, and and they find way, I mean, it's easy if you don't have a prayer defense to be hit by witchcraft. Christians don't understand that they if they're not in prayer and putting the blood of Jesus upon them, praying that the angels of God surround their property, uh, guarding above and below against every dimensional access point, if they're not praying against the sending of curses, that every curse, hex, spell, incantation, form of witchcraft, voodoo, dark art, or other form of weaponized demonic activity being sent against them is being stopped, is being inhibited, is being reversed upon the heads of the senders in certain occasions, uh, they, they will get hit by this stuff. And it can cause 
a lot of problems. And then they don't know what to do because they believe they can't get hit by witchcraft. <laughs> Christians... Just because you said a prayer of salvation doesn't mean that you are always and forever immune to witchcraft, folks. And I have uh, prayed with enough believers to know that this is true. As a matter of fact, I have a prayer, and it's available on my website for free download. It's called a prayer of defense. It's a prayer that I say every night before I go to bed. And um, because I would get hit with stuff, <laughs> praying two hours a day, I would get hit with stuff, even in my sleep. And I'd know that I was suddenly in a battle I shouldn't have to be dealing with. And I refined this prayer to stop everything before it even came to me. Because I know that this happens. And, and I can only imagine for believers that, that don't know how to pray or how to defend themselves according to the weapons of our warfare and, and, and which we have been given, which includes the armor of God in, in um, what is it, Ephesians 6. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, I designed this prayer because there, there are things that we need to pray for and understand that will happen. If people come under bondages because of outside forces at times. And those need to be broken. Also, sexual relationships. And this is a big one. Because, um, they, you know, when, when you're having sex, sex is a spiritual sin as well as a physical sin. It, it, it transcends both natures. And really, it seems like there is a deposit made um, in both directions when sexual intercourse happens between two individuals. Um, uh, that can be carried into further sexual uh, in, in, in involvement and, and so forth. And um, this thing gets really messy. Uh, it really comes out in, in uh, deliverance sessions when you get into it and you're saying, you know, wow, okay, now we're following the leading of the Spirit and now we have to resolve all these issues. The Holy Spirit's giving revelation. All right, you were with this person and this is what came on you because of that. And then after that, you were with this person and this is what came on you and then it came together and this is why this is happening. You know, all these things begin to go, okay, folks, there's a reason why God put one man, one woman and said, now get married and come in holy covenant. This is the way sex is to be done. Uh, the devil centers a lot of his activity around the sex act, a lot of rituals. This is, there's a whole branch of magic called sex magic. I mean, th th this stuff is very wicked, it's, it's evil, and it's because there's, a, uh, uh, there's certain things that are opened up during unrighteous uh, marriage outside of sex, and people have no idea about this. And, and, and this puts people in bondage, okay? When you go, you sleep around, you have lots of partners, you are in bondage. I don't care who you are or how pro you think you are. You, you think you're just the man or just the woman and you're empowered and, and you're good looking and you're this and that and so forth. It's so easy for you, whatever. It's, well, you know what? You are in deception. You are in bondage. And uh, that bondage will follow you until you renounce it and break it in the name of Jesus. And uh, oftentimes this also involves the severing of soul ties when you've been involved in all these different sexual relationships. So, listener, if this is you, I encourage you, <laughs> repent and re re renounce those acts with those people and ask God to send angels to sever all of those soul ties that that I I emerge because um, th th this is bondage. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I was just thinking about, and I... It's the first time I've had this thought when discussing this topic. Is can you imagine the bondage the poor prostitutes are under? It, I mean, it's, every act, well, and every person. My goodness. Now, um, I will say this: that in my experience uh, ministering to people, um, there are you know certain uh, sexual encounters that seem to leave a greater impression upon people than others and uh sometimes when it's like in in that case with prostitutes god's grace there's no way they can ever remember every person and act every it's part impossible we know. but uh they can renounce it all and and put their faith that they are doing that and god's grace will take care of everything they can't remember uh, but yes i and i mean the thing the the, the thing is the bondage to guilt, the bondage to low self-esteem, the bondage to um, really a false view of self, 
you know, trash. I mean, these these identity uh, beliefs overtake these people. It's they they don't see themselves have, as having any value. The weight is so heavy. It's it's so clear. It's there. I mean, and th- this all needs to be resolved in the process of ministry. So yeah, it's incredible. And that's not found in the mainstream churches at all because uh, I don't think they, they understand. I really don't. No. No, unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem like this is the case at all. And so, um, I mean, uh, and, and here's another thing. You know, I, I, I've seen different things happen in, in in prayer, working with people that are just bizarre. I mean, and, and and the only way to explain them is to understand that you are getting into heavenly planes and dimensions, which, well, you don't fully understand how they work. You know, I, I remember I was praying with one individual, and he was really having a problem connecting with God, and he had received Jesus, and he was earnestly seeking Jesus, but he, uh, you know, he, he had some bondages to pornography, and he was trying to repent of that. But during one incident, he uh, he basically thought that he had uh, said the uh, like committed the unpardonable sin. Oh dear. He said he committed the unpardonable sin, and he's and so. He's having problem accessing God, and he is just stuck on this issue. He's like, every time I pray, I can't feel God. I don't feel his presence when I go to church. I don't feel anything. I think that I have committed the unpardonable sin, and there's no hope for me. But I want Jesus so bad. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm personally having conflict with this because I'm like, well, can someone want Jesus this bad and yet have no access to Jesus at this point? Like, I, and, I, you know, I prayed about it, and I didn't feel that that was the case. And later on, okay, just to fast forward a, a while, um, he did end up having some breakthrough and experiencing the presence of God again and going back into relationship and so forth. So, But he thought that it was over for him. There was no hope. He was just going to hell now. He was going to heaven, but now he's going to hell. And and he, here's some things. Okay, I'm praying for him, and suddenly it's like I see this dark, tall spirit standing behind him. And it has its hand through his back and is literally holding on to his heart. And it's like, okay, what is that spirit doing? And I didn't see this in the natural. Okay, I'm praying. I'm seeing this like I explained before. Inside of my spirit, I'm perceiving this picture. And I say, wow. What is this doing here? And why is it positioned like that? Hold, no, no, let me, I take that back. It was not holding his heart. It was gripping his shoulder. Not his heart. It was gripping his shoulder. But it was, it was like, it, it just held him there. So he couldn't move. But uh, I'm in, enjoying this show. I hope you guys are too. I always learn so much when I speak with you, with him. Um, his website is, uh, www.bridemovement.com He has some excellent audios because he does his own show, Discovering the Truth with Dan Duval. I mean, you you can actually find yourself... Um, uh, sorry, Dan, but you were off air. <laughs> I don't know where oh, it went oh, off. <laughs> oh, was I? Yeah, go figure, yeah, you huh? you kicked out a chat room, too. You were talking about that big black shadow. I thought it was me because my my phone is acting up. Um, okay, well that I'm a uh, big black I'm shadow holding uh, the guy back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, looks like I'm back now. Wow. Okay, so I was just dead air for all that time. Yep. Were you talking? I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, you know this doesn't. I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, you know this is this is the thing. The devil will try, but I'll just repeat myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna repeat myself, and I, I guess you can go in the archive and just um, delete that. But um, okay, so I see this spirit, and it has its hand on his shoulder, and it's just holding him there. It's like he can't go anywhere. And 
And, and, and the thing is, okay, what am I looking at? I am actually looking at an event that is presently occurring to his spirit man that he needs deliverance from and to which needs the application of the power of Jesus Christ. Because whatever that thing is that has its hand on his shoulder and is holding him there, and really the hand was like on his shoulder but integrated into the shoulder, almost as if it had been fused to the shoulder, so it was like this uh, seemingly unbreakable bond <laughs> to, to this, this So it's pretty and much entrenched, yeah. It was pretty much attached. And I think it may have been some kind of death spirit or something, um, possibly an antichrist spirit, I'm not sure, but what I do know is that that is what I perceived, and what I said after that was, um, you know, we prayed according to this, but there was a turnaround time. It took some time of him really earnestly seeking God and following this thing through to finally get his breakthrough where he was experiencing the presence of God again. It did not come about immediately, Um, but, but what I'm saying is, Believers, well, we need to understand that our spirits will experience things on the heavenly plane that we are not aware of, but are significantly impacting our lives nonetheless. Another time, I was praying with an individual, and uh, I was across, I was like literally on the other side of the room, and I began to do the same thing. I was perceiving uh, the location of their their spirit man, and it was like it was in this amber case. It was like it was in this case, and and what was outside was kind of blocked from coming in, and what was inside was kind of blocked from going out. Is this amber case? Where am I seeing this? My eyes are closed. I'm seeing it on the inside of my spirit. What is this? This is really, I believe, the operation of the discerning of spirits. Um, and I, and I know I operated. I, as a matter of fact, on one occasion, this gift was even imparted into another individual while I was praying, uh, because that's what God wanted to happen. Um, <laughs> yes. Folks, uh, even Paul exercised the giving of gifts through the ministry of the laying on of hands. Okay, uh, that is clear in the book of Timothy. So, anyway, um, when on this occasion, I saw his, his spirit and I saw him, and he was sitting in this glass case. And so I prayed. I said, God, he shouldn't be in here. In the name of Jesus, I assign angels to go forth and to break this amber case, which is separating him, because he was having a hard time uh, really going past a certain level with God. He he was kind of like, felt like he was on the outskirts, you know, he was just kind of cruising along, but there was always something keeping him from getting closer. So, I, I, I perceived this thing, I prayed. On the other side of the room, I say these words, and he practically collapses. Physically. Why? Because a very spiritual event happened on the spiritual plane as a result of the words that I spoke in response to the gift of God, which was an operation, to execute the delivering power of Jesus to liberate him from something that was in operation against him in the spirit realm. And this guy had gone to Bible school with me, was saved, baptized, spoke in tongues. And it had led worship before thousands of people before. So I'm saying, this is a, a whole other level of operation. People need to people need to understand that when Jesus said in Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, and I'm, I'm going to read this one because this is really good. Um, there is such a thing as spiritual prisons. And the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them which are bound. Now this isn't just the opening of the prison to them which are bound in sin to salvation in Jesus Christ. This is the opening of prisons that are presently manifesting in the second heaven to keep people out of their inheritance. And so Jesus will set them free from that too. And uh, and I tell you, eh, more Christians are bound in the heavens than you can imagine. Because they don't even know that well, they are. <laughs> that's what I, was my next question. Um, I'm wondering, now see, I had to find out from someone else that because a grandfather committed suicide, that there was a generational curse going on. And I'm beginning to wonder if 
some of these things that affect us and bind us from the spirit realm are meant to be more discernible by other people than ourselves about our own stuff, if if that is part of what we're supposed to be doing for each other, is well, being yeah, enough. <laughs> Sorry? Absolutely. Oh, okay, here's the thing, okay? Let's say uh, I tied a person down and I beat them with a stick for one hour until they're bruised and delirious and their head's spinning, Okay. Now I now I put the key in next to them and I say, okay, now uh, untangle yourself and take yourself out of this mess. But I'll be back in five minutes to beat you some more. Hey, what are the odds that that person is going to be able to, in that state, unbind themselves, even if they're given the ability to do so, the inheritance to do so, the authority to do so? They're so hurting, they don't have it in them to do it themselves. That's why God needs the body to minister to the body. <laughs> he, it, 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 it really is. It really is hard to um, unbind one's self from the heavens when the weight of all of these things is presently occurring. It is really almost necessary at times to have help. God can do anything. And God can be all the help that we need. And I know that I've read accounts where God has literally taken someone and unshackled them completely as a divine act of provision and providence. They didn't need anybody to tell them anything. They didn't need anybody to do anything. And now they are saved and set free preaching the gospel. And there are rare cases where this happens. So I don't deny the providence of God. But God has a body and he designed his body to work a certain way. And he's not going to supersede the designs of his body all the time just because he sees how much we're failing. He's going to give us an opportunity to do things right and to use the resources that we've been given to become his hands and feet in the world. He needs us to do that. And, uh, and, and yes, uh, okay, here's the other side of this issue. It's a maturity thing. Maturity comes as we grow in Christ spiritually. So maturity really means that your spirit, which is operating in heaven presently right now, as I've already explained, grows up. So let's say I were to look at your spirit when you first got saved. Well, what I would see is a little baby with a poo-poo diaper, crying all the time. You can't even feed yourself. You have to have someone preach to you everything because you don't understand the Bible. Okay? Uh, you need to desire the sincere milk of the word, right? But as you pass the tests, and God will give you tests, you have to pass them. When you don't pass tests, you keep circling the same mountain, you never go anywhere. When you pass the tests, when you spend that time in prayer, when you spend that time in the word, when you submit yourself even under difficult situations and you graduate under the ministries of others, in the spirit realm, you will grow. And that gives you greater access to your inheritance. With a baby spirit, you cannot access all of your inheritance. Any military general knows that you don't give a baby a grenade. You give it to a trained soldier because the baby will do nothing but blow themselves up. You don't give a multinational ministry to a baby in Christ. You give it to a grown-up because otherwise they'll blow themselves to bits. And they'll hurt people. Even people that have grown up <laughs> hurt people and blow themselves to bits at times. And so, you know, in the spirit realm, this is really real spiritual growth means what does your spirit man look like in the spirit realm? If I encounter your spirit man as a demon, am I going to be scared of it? Or am I going to just poke it with a stick and laugh at it because it's a joke to me? Because I know you're lukewarm. Because I know you're not growing. And because I know you're stunted. This is spiritual growth, okay? It, some people think that spiritual growth just means you went to enough Bible studies. It, that's not what it means, Okay? I tell you, spiritual growth is determined by your stature in the spirit realm. All right, and, 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 and as we grow, we gain access to greater resources of heaven, which allow us as maturing believers, as young men in Christ, as the book of 1 John puts it, or as 
fathers in the faith, as the book of First John puts it. We can turn around and use our resources, which we now have access to, where we didn't have access before, to go back and help others which are now in bondage, needing resources, and, and really their personal authority over their own lives isn't working yet for them because they're just, just too broken. So we need to turn around and do that. <laughs> I'm telling you, Sounds we like understand a the job. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. It's just, no, I, I just keep saying that sounds like a big job because as you're speaking, from what I can hear, I'm going to have to go back and listen to the archives because I missed about half of it because of the phone. It's got to be by phone. Um, uh-huh. As I'm listening to you speaking, I'm seeing what we need to be doing, and I'm not seeing us doing it. And And I'm trying to figure out how to get there from here as a body. Oh, how do we get there from here? Yes, and we've what only got, question. what, seven minutes and something. Yeah. Well, you know, he- here's what I would say um, to that question. How do we get there? It's not easy to get there. It's not easy. So, listener... If you want to walk in some of the things I'm talking about, don't think that hearing me talk about it is going to do it for you, okay? Um, In order to walk into some of the things I'm talking about, uh, going into the spirit realm, interacting with spiritual objects. Oh, here's another thing. Oh, my gosh. I I have to say this. Some people have visions regularly about the conditions of other people, places, even cities and regions. And they just look at it, and all they do is write it down. I have learned that there is another level of operation based on that gift that you need to embrace. You have the authority to go into that vision and execute commands. You literally have the authority to begin to make decrees according to the word of God against those things which are revealed to you in visions pertaining to the works of darkness, the mysteries of iniquity, the things which are holding people in bondage, and command those things which you see to be broken, to be overthrown, to be interrupted, and to be canceled. I'm telling you, God gives visions so that people can execute his word and loose the armies of heaven against the works of darkness. When I learned that I could have a vision and activate the power of God based on the revelation in that vision, a lot changed for me in my ministry. A lot changed for me in my ministry. I'm telling you. You can overthrow principalities and powers when you understand that you, when, when God takes you there, you don't just have the vision to write it down. You can take that vision and speak the word of God into it and begin to recreate in the spirit realm in that very moment. And, and that, that's one, I didn't get into creative power. And I wish, uh, see, there's, at this juncture, Dorothy, at this juncture where we are, this is where a lot of my revelation even just picks up. Because there's so many things I can't say until I've said what, I, what it took me two hours to say today. There's, there's so many things. One of those is creative power. Because you will understand creative power in the spirit before you understand creative power in the natural. If you don't understand how to create in the spirit realm and in the second heaven with your words as a child of God, fully embracing that identity, you're not going to be that Christian who will command a fig tree to die and watch it die. But when you do, you can make that transition and begin to, according to the will and word of God, recreate this realm and literal three-dimensional realities. This is what God has in store for his people. I'm telling you, we're going to see this. And, uh, but, but, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, even when I was in Rwanda, there was a demonic attack on the speaker system itself. The speakers were, were like, Bumping in and out, bumping in and out. I turned around yeah, and told him, stop. I, I, I know that feeling tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tonight. Was like, stop. <laughs> yeah, but on this occasion, on this occasion, I, I did. I turned around. I looked at the speaker. I said, stop. I just looked at the speaker. I said, stop. And he stopped. 
that moment, just done. It, it just, the whole thing stops. And, 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 and there's it, it coming a place where, uh, when we're really, and it, you know, it helps to be already uh, flowing in, 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 people call it the anointing. Really, the anointing is a spiritual endowment for a particular purpose. The Spirit of the Lord is kind of overtaking your activities as He emerges from His place within you. Uh, when that is in operation, it's easier to drift into these kinds of things, much, much easier, because it's natural. But, uh, you know, there's a place of creative power. Okay, but, okay, now coming back, um, so what do we need to do to get access to some of these things? We need to grow, okay, folks? You, you need to understand, I need to grow. I need to grow. I need the Word of God. I need to memorize Scripture. Oh, yes, you do. People think that they can, you know, become super Christian and know three Scriptures. Good luck. You know, one of the things that God told me about warring in the heavens, he gave me a list of seven rules for warring in the heavens. I, I can look at my document and read it to you, but um, one of those rules is know your weapons. What are the weapons of our warfare? <laughs> well, we have defensive uh, armor, right? But we also have weapons. And they are not carnal but mighty. They're spiritual. They're for the tearing down of strongholds. What does that? The word of God in our mouth being activated by faith. You need to know the word of God for every situation and circumstance you plan to be ministering to. If you want to minister healing, know healing scriptures. You want to minister deliverance, you better know that the word of God says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and that God has given you power over all the power of the enemy and to trample upon serpents and scorpions and nothing would by any means hurt you. That Jesus trampled upon principalities and powers, triumphing over them in it. You have to know what you can say. Because if you don't, you won't. And you will lose. So, so okay, you need to do these things, folks. Memorize and know scripture. You need to spend time in prayer. All authority comes from being under authority. And the process of coming under God's authority, truly, really, in your heart, in your subconscious, placing yourself under God's authority, will not come apart from true relationship. Because that's where trust comes, okay? You trust someone you know. So you need the prayer time. And you need to pass. I, I keep coming back to tests, 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 tests. Okay, before God let Gideon deliver the nation of Israel from the armies that were persecuting them, he told him, remove all the idols from your father's house. That was a test. If he couldn't remove those idols from his father's house, God was going to find someone else to, I mean, you, you, you have to pass the test. And if you don't, you are suspending your assignments. You are suspending. Spending your destiny, and God is waiting on you. Sometimes people will get a word from the Lord. He'll say, do this. Five years later, I'll talk to them. They'll say, man, I'm stuck. they say, well, what have you done since God told you that? Oh, man, I didn't remember. that. God did tell me to do that. You'll say, well, why is God going to tell you to do anything else until you pass the last test he gave you? You have to pass it. See, this is because when we pass tests, God sees that we are faithful. And... Those that are with the Lord in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, he says that they are called and chosen and faithful. We, we need to prove our faithfulness by passing the tests. And as we pass tests, which come in seasons, there is a season to everything, then we graduate and we gain stature in the spirit realm. And we gain authority in the spirit realm. We're down to 60 seconds, Daniel. I think, I am, uh, I think I'm all done. Are you done? I'm done. Until the next time? <laughs> <laughs> that's the best way to ask you back. Yes. Well, I think we need to say good night to everybody. Um, I don't know if you're having trouble with your studio when you do your show, but mine has been wonky lately. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for coming. And Father bless you all. And good night. And download, download the archive to get all the good bits. 
Thanks for having me, you Dorothy. Say good night, God Daniel? bless you. Oh, thanks yes. for coming. Yes, thank you, and uh, thank you so much for everyone that listened and for everyone that will listen. My website, www.bridemovements.com. And Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall on Blog Talk Radio. He yes. usually does his show on Tuesday. Good yes. night, everybody. Good night, Daniel. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye.